British Academy and American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is the author of Reasons and Persons, Oxford 1984, and On What Matters, Oxford 2011, and the recipient of the 2014 Rolf Schock Prize. In recent years, he has been a visiting professor at Harvard. Professor Parfit made seminal contributions to philosophy in many areas, including our thinking about future generations, personal identity, consequentialism, and I'll let you guys start it off. I think I'll just start it off by saying uh, what an honor it is that uh, this, to work with students who are organizing such fabulous events, uh, that it's an honor uh, to be part of. And I'll just uh, call on Derek, perhaps, to start us off uh, with a few comments that he has prepared especially for this event. And uh, we'll take it from there. I find it immensely heartening that some of you and many other young people at Harvard, Oxford, Rutgers, and elsewhere have joined in creating groups whose aim is to do something to relieve or prevent the great suffering and early deaths of some of the world's two billion poorest people. I greatly admire and applaud what you're doing and hope your groups will continue to grow and achieve more. Now, I should now make various remarks about how you could most effectively do good and why it's what you ought to do. And my plan for this session is roughly the following. I think there are two great evils that we need to consider. The first you're familiar with is responding to great global inequality and suffering. The second, often called existential risks, risks to the future of humanity. I think that's the main alternative as having comparable importance. I'm going to start by discussing the first of those. I shall make some remarks, then Nia will put some questions and we'll have a general discussion. And then I want to switch to existential risks. Probably spend less time on that, but it's philosophically much harder. Um, and in that way, it's more interesting. Now, I should start with what seems to me the most fundamental and often overlooked relevant moral truth. Oxford's similar group calls itself giving what we can. This name is in one trivial way misleading. The people in this group won't give what they can since they could give more. <laughs> the name is also misleading in another serious way. The money that they send to the best aid agencies, such as Oxfam and Doctors Without Borders, isn't really theirs to give. We rich people aren't morally entitled to our great wealth and the high incomes that most of you will fairly soon start earning. It's merely our good luck that we're vastly richer than the two billion people, most in sub-Saharan Africa, who live on only a few dollars a day and don't even have safe, clean water. We may believe that our ancestors earned their wealth by discovering resources and tilling new parts of the earth, but Locke himself, to whom many libertarians appeal, said that we can justly acquire new resources by mixing our labor with it, only if we leave enough and as good for others. Now, we haven't come close to doing that. And most rich people are not even aware of how we are now treating the poorest people in the world. In several opinion polls, when Americans are asked how much the United States gives in foreign aid of that kind, they generally say that the figure is 10 to 15%. Well, as you know, it's about 0.2%. That's a staggering misbelief about the situation. Godwin, Shelley's father-in-law, described things more accurately. Every shilling in my pocket, Godwin writes, has received its destination from the dictates of reason. 
Many resources should go to those who need them most. If we walk past some beggar, Godwin said, the shilling or dollars in our pocket belong to the beggar in the moral sense. And if we don't hand over this money, we're not failing to give in the moral sense, but stealing. The money is ours only in the legal sense. As the French writer later wrote, property is theft. <laughs> the property is le vol. I got that right. Instead of the misleading name, giving what we can, you've chosen the much better name, effective altruism. We partial altruists control many resources, and we can decide to use some of it to prevent these greatest evils. Now, we have two main questions. Which are the greatest evils, and what ought we do to try to present them? I shall revert to using give in the non-moral sense that just means hand over. According to some act consequentialists, we ought to transfer to others, or give in the legal sense, up to the point at which we are as poor and needy as the other poorest people. Now, hardly any of we rich people are going to do that. Nor, I think, is it worth trying to decide just how much we ought morally to give or transfer to others. There isn't, I believe, any precise or even fairly precise answer to that question. Most of us will act wrongly by failing to give what we ought to give, but this kind of wrongness is a matter of degree, and there are different senses in which acts can be wrong. Our acts may not be blameworthy, for example, since we may be giving much more than most other people give. <coughs> Rather than asking what's morally required, our main thought should be that it would be better if we give more. Now, as I've said, I think this is the greatest moral problem we and other rich people are likely to face, and the way in which you are most likely to act in ways that are seriously wrong, as would be true if we don't give much more than most other people give. Uh, we can next note that it isn't only at consequentialists who believe that we ought to try to prevent such evils, even at considerable cost to ourselves. Singer argued well for this in what I wish was the most widely read article, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, which is fairly widely read. Imagine you're passing a pond and you see a child drowning. Clearly, we would all believe you ought to save his life, even if you'll ruin your best suit, or you'll fail to be able to attend some meeting that you very strongly want to attend. <coughs> well, how much difference, Singer asked, would it make if there wasn't only one child who was drowning, but several, and you could only say one of them in time, being swept towards some waterfall. Then, how much difference would it make if it isn't only you who could save one of these children, but several other people could save one of these children, and you see they're not doing it? Well, as he rightly says, most of us would answer the question, no, you ought to save the one child. Can't be the case your duty goes away when you see there are other children as well. Nor can it be the case that it ceases to be your duty because other people aren't doing their duty. Well then, the only thing that's left, how much difference does it make if the child you could save, or the children, some of whose lives you could save, are not right in front of you, but a long way away. Well, that can be thought to make much some difference, but it's very hard to believe that it makes such a huge difference as the attitudes that most people have seem to imply. That argument doesn't at all appeal to act consequentialists. Well, I shall start with some remarks about this. These are very rough notes. We need to decide 
which are the evils of the poorest people of the world that we most ought to contribute. I think that in many ways it's better to state the aim as relieving or preventing suffering even though it's plausible to think that saving lives is morally more important. Saving lives is often morally more important, but there's a strange way in which, although it's worse to kill someone who's having a happy life than to make the person suffer, though that is worse, it's less obviously wrong, because it's not in itself bad to be dead, it's just the absence of a good. And there's also the point that a lot of the problems in these parts of the world are the result of overpopulation. The World Health Organization now gives the highest priority to saving the lives of the youngest children. I think that's a mistake because people can very easily have doubts about the value of that. Um, even if you think that it's clearer that we ought to save the lives of children than that we ought to prevent and relieve suffering, I think you get a more straightforward response if you concentrate on things in which it's absolutely clear how bad what's happening is. And so there are other causes of suffering, like saving a young mother from going blind. I'd give greater weight to that in your discussions with other people than saving the life of a newly born baby, for obvious reasons. Now, I shall switch to some practical suggestions. First, and this may be quite unnecessary here, we should all be vegetarians. Vegan. <laughs> Perhaps Vegan. we should be vegans too. The great cruelty of factory farming especially if such animals as cows, pigs, and perhaps children, chickens, is enough. But cows also produce nearly 10% of the increase in global warming, the methane that they emit. It's overwhelmingly clear that we should not eat meat. Second, we shouldn't have more than two. have no children, that's one way of doing good. Because extra rich people make the position worse. Third, if you have children, as most as you will, let them know that they'll inherit little from you. They should know that throughout their life. Fourth, in spending your income on yourselves, try to do that not by consuming, but by acquiring things that will increase their value so that when you die, you can give more help to others. And that's true of spending money on getting and improving a house, for example, which will rise in value. So don't waste resources by consuming them. Invest them, even if you partly do that in a way that benefits you. Now, a harder question. Should you work yourself in some effective aid agency. You will then earn much less than in most other jobs. But the good that you will know that you are personally doing will be a great reward. As Singer notes, there's much empirical evidence that people who are closely engaged in relieving suffering and helping others in other ways, thereby increase their own happiness. They earn much less, but they have rewarding lives. Unfortunately, as Singer and others have argued, particularly someone whose names have been Crouch and McCaskill, he changed his name, this may not be the most effective way to try to reduce suffering and early death. You may be a more effective altruist if you choose some career in which you can earn a great deal and then give much of it away to these aid agencies. Someone else will then do the work that in the agency you yourself would have done. And the money that you give may enable this agency to pay the much lower income of several other people working in this way. Now, if 
by earning a great deal and giving, you could aim three or four other people to do the work that you would have done, that will certainly do more good, even though it may be a less rewarding way of doing it for you. Instead of actually helping people getting involved with them, sensitive you, you merely sign some checks. That will do more good, but it won't be rewarding to you, so in a way that's a harder course to take. Now, um, there's also a risk that you will lose your intention to give away much of your income if you take that course. There are some possibilities in between these two. Instead of going to work in a law firm or becoming a doctor or working in Wall Street or some other financial agency and earning great sums, much of which you can give away. You can do something in the middle. You might work in a university hoping to persuade more other people of the importance of acting in this way. Or, um, if you want to be more closely involved, since you have unusually high intelligence, rather than going out and actually helping, you may better spend your time in thinking of new ways of getting help done. Um, oh goodness, I'm not brought with me one of my pages. Too bad. Frank, yeah, so which page do you need? That's there? okay, it doesn't matter. Um, I can add two things, I remember what I was going to say next. Um, here's one way of trying to respond to the danger that if you go the route of earning a lot of money and giving it away, your idealism may fade. Uh, you formed this admirable group. I have a variant or an addition to this kind of activity that may seem cynical, uh, but it's one of my thoughts about how things can be done. Um, when people, idealistic young people, together form a group, I think they should not only commit themselves to giving some percentage of their income when they start earning and for the rest of their working life. I think the most natural figure to go for, we might discuss that later, is actually 10%, not more than that. Um, as well as joining such a group, the organization should send everyone who joined an annual newsletter, and that newsletter would report if some members of the original group have ceased to make their contribution. <laughs> now, I've been attacked for making this suggestion, but it's much easier to cease to contribute than to announce to the other members in your group whom you remember that you stop contributing. I think that's an example of a suggestion that might do quite a lot of good. Um, there are various other ways, I think, in which people have thought of new schemes. One that I read only two days ago, and therefore took me in favor of it, is um, campaigning for an extension of present rules, according to which food that's sold tells you the proportion of fat, the proportion of sugar, the proportion of fiber, and so on. That's a legal requirement. In the case of very many other things that are sold, you can have a similar legal requirement in which it would be reported, I'm not sure what the details would be, the extent to which the good that you're buying is ecologically damaging to produce and ecologically difficult or damaging to get rid of. One example I was surprised to learn is running shoes. They can only produce in ways that create serious risks to health workers, and their disposal is particularly difficult. Now, if every time you could buy something and you didn't know which to buy, lots of people would choose the one that got the highest rating from this agency that's concerned with damaging the environment. 
So that's an example of a kind of campaign um, <coughs> that I think people should pursue. Um, perhaps I shall stop my first presentation here. We've got enough to discuss. So. Thanks so much, Rick. There. So I want to ask a couple questions and then we'll open it because uh, there were so many issues that uh, we touched on. I'm sure the students would have many questions. Very briefly, yes. There's a lot more to say about many of them. Here is, here is one question. Um, you, you started out with this very intriguing, for those of you who are familiar with the uh, philosophical debates in recent decades about whether it's your duty to give to global aid or not, a very interesting and not often heard position that um, there is a duty to give because we are above, getting above our fair shares, if you will, and so the rest is, uh, as Paul Don said, uh, theft. We owe it. Um, that is an idea that I can couch most naturally, not so much in, say, Peter Singer's utilitarian framework, because it, it's most but, natural option is give to the ones who have least, you know, the poor yeah, fathers yeah. for their fair share, not necessarily to where the money would do the most good. And it's also not so natural for me to cast it in terms of the idea, which is called prioritarianism, which you're famous for having yeah. championed in yeah. earlier work. So I'm thinking of a case where we could do the most good, in an atypical case, by giving it to the rich. Sometimes, say, we, we work, some of us work on, on the distribution of health resources. Sometimes if you intervene and give a health intervention in the city to the middle class where it's cheap to reach people, credible that there would be high rates of adherence, you can generate more credibly a lot of good than if you go to the remote rural areas where people are faring worst. And so well, the that is, is greatest there. Well, that actually uh, Maybe goes say what against libertarianism is. the priority view. Um, I think there's actually not much difference between the three most familiar discussed views in this area. Before I turn to that, let me say, the reason I brought up the question of ownership, of course, at consequentialists give very little position to ownership. Okay. Most people think ownership is very important, and most people think about this as how much ought I to give? And they just assume that it's theirs to give. And so when I say, no, it isn't yours, you have the good fortune to have control over all this wealth, but there's no sense morally in which it's yours. It's just legally yours. That, I think, would affect many more people's thinking than to have it pointed out that they could do more good. Because if you regard it as how much I, I ought to give, then that's, as it were, supererogatory. It's mine, and I can do what I like with it, and how much should I give away? But if you think that it doesn't morally belong to you, then it's immediately much less clear how you could defend not transferring much of these resources to others. Um, now, with respect to uh, utilitarianism, the two alternatives are egalitarian and prioritarian. The difference is the, the utilitarians say you should try and minimize the sum of suffering minus happiness. Often it's the other way around. They say maximize the sum of happiness minus suffering. But it's better to put the suffering first. Okay. Regardless of how the suffering is distributed between different people. And so I'll switch back to happiness because it's more familiar. One of two outcomes, you do more good if you create a greater total sum of benefit than you would if there was a smaller sum, but it was more equally distributed. Egalitarians say, no, no, it isn't just the total sum. It's often better to... Prioritarians say, instead of saying you should try and distribute goods more equally, it says benefiting people matters more, the worse off those people are. And it supports very similar conclusions. 
but it doesn't face the leavening down objection. There's nothing to be said for some people becoming as badly off as anyone else. But now, thirdly, I think that in this discussion, the disagreements between those views are irrelevant. And one way of putting that is that the most celebrated and influential egalitarian views, like those of John Rawls, according to which the distribution should be the one that maximizes the position of the very worst off people. Okay? Because that's applied within a moral community, like a nation, doesn't apply globally. Whereas utilitarians does apply globally, so actually utilitarians are more in favor of radically redistributing than egalitarians and prioritarians. But I don't think the disagreement between those three makes much difference here, because the stakes are so high and the difference that you can make is so obvious that all those views are going to agree. Um, is there any practical importance to debates between moving to another kind of debate that philosophers like to uh, think about a lot, that consequentialism and views that endorse the so-called constraints? No, I don't think that has any relevance here. Um, well, the most effective ways to relieve or prevent suffering and early death don't involve violating constraints, like in the standard case, killing someone to use five of his organs to save the lives of five other people. True, that would make the outcome better, but most of us think it's wrong. Now, those cases just are irrelevant to the questions you're discussing. So, in other words, there is a, there is a kind of a few years of tradition that a lot of effective uh, altruists um, have been utilitarians or other consequentialists. In fact, a no, lot of philosophers out there of every stripe could be effective altruists. Yes, yes. Um, Tell that to your teachers at the philosophy department here. But I mean, that's why I stress the point about it isn't yours to give, because you know, that's the one <laughs> that will affect the people who's main moral thinking is largely deontological. So, final question uh, that I will ask, the students actually asked, uh, they say they define a view as philatral localism, and that view gives priority to giving locally, and they wanted to hear what you think about such priority. I think that there's something to be said for that at the very smallest level where you get actually involved. But if it's a matter of giving to aid organizations, they're going to pass on the resources to the worst off people in your nation, I think there's nothing to be said for it. Because the worst off people in your nation are going to be so much better off than the worst off people elsewhere that um, there's nothing to be said to giving them priority because they're members of your nation. Now that's a bit easier for Europeans to grasp because now I don't think of myself as you know, particularly United Kingdom. You know, it's part of the European community, which is part of the larger community of nations. Whereas America is a very single, separate, sovereign nation and you have much more of a sense that that's what you are. But no, I, don't, I think philanthropy applies only at a very local level. Of course, if you actually go out there and help the people in your community, there are many ways in which that's very well worth doing. It's also, we can add, much more rewarding for you. Um, but that's as far as I would go with philanthropolocalism, if that's what you call it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So, uh, we want to get some questions uh, from you guys, and then we'll... Well, I mean, let me mention one other thing, which I think I meant to raised but I didn't. There is one important difference uh, between act consequentialism and rule consequentialism. The rule consequentialists believe that we ought to do what's required by the rules whose general acceptance would on the whole make things go best. And it's wrong to act in ways that would be disallowed by principles whose general acceptance would make things go best. Now, that does produce a distinctively different answer 
it's rather hard for an act consequentialist to deny that you ought to go on contributing until you've contributed a very great proportion of the resources you control. But if you ask the question, what's the proportion such that things would go best if people believe that that's how much they ought to give, the figure is going to be quite different. And this is partly for reasons like the following. It's often been shown that if you invite donations uh, and you've said other people have given 10%, people are much more likely to join and give 10%. If you said other people are giving 30%, people say to hell with that. You know, <laughs> not going to do So uh, you have an interesting empirical question. What's the amount such that if people believe that's what they ought to give, that would make things go best? And it's fairly plausible that about 10% is the right amount. Now, for a country with so many religious people as America, that has some advantage in that it's in the religious tradition. But I think it's a good figure. Um, and I'm inclined to think that if a group of you young people decide a hundred of you to join some group who pledge to give for the rest of your working life, maybe you should only choose 10%. Um, you might be more ambitious and more of you might sign, but then it's more likely that it's going to unravel. Um, so I think that does make a difference. Now, um, Other? Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm concerned about not so much what you should give in terms of resources and time, but the responsibility you have to make this investment of time and money as valuable to the people you're trying to help as possible. So we need not only criteria about what we should give, but also well, that's what groups we give. that's why I raised the to some people rather unwelcome point that if you ask how can you do most good it's likely that the answer is by earning a lot of money and giving a lot of it away and that is in some ways disappointing to people, uh, because they actually live a happier life if they go out and help people than if they earn money which they can then give away um, when I said they were in between, well, I mean, particularly for a lawyer, <laughs> you can go and become a very rich lawyer, or you can teach in law school. Actually, they get paid quite a lot. <laughs> but, I mean, there are compromises. But, in other words, I think it's rather hard to avoid the conclusion that the most appealing and rewarding ways of helping to relieve and prevent suffering and early death aren't to go and help doing that yourself, but to earn enough that you can support the income of several other people doing it. Now, um, I don't know how people respond to that, but I think it's probably true. And the main reason for saying that it isn't true would be the rather more cynical view that people who do that aren't going to live up to the intention and they'll start just not giving away. <laughs> in other words, you pledge yourself to give 10%, but if you take this route, and you go and you earn a great deal in Wall Street or as a lawyer, then you should pledge to give 30%, 40%. That's how you can <laughs> do more. Um, now, if it really is the case that people who do that, their idealism fades, even if you added the scheme that then everyone gets the newsletter and says that so-and-so, though still working in Wall Street, <laughs> has ceased to make its contributions. <laughs> that might be a way of avoiding that danger. Now, I don't know if that answers at least part of what you had in mind. No, I was being more about the responsibility you have to make sure that the, that, that what you give, in other words, that you have to stay connected to the money. I mean, if you, oh, if you, you use need... it for your own activities, fine, but as soon as you have it to other people, over the course of a lifetime, it's likely to get fairly estranged from you and your 
original intent. Well, that's why I said it's much less rewarding. You're doing more good, but you're not doing it in a way that, you know, you don't have grateful people who are grateful to you personally for what you've done to them. <laughs> so I think that just is a difficult choice. Yes. Um, so I, I'm curious if, if, if the recommendation for this global optimum is that most people pursue a path that leads them to making a lot of money, and then you can use that money to enable others to do good. Yeah. Is there some kind of... Well, obviously that isn't going to apply if everybody starts to do it. Of course. <laughs> but they won't be able to because only a small proportion are going to earn these highest salaries. So for those people, is there some breaking point criterion where what they're doing um, becomes in and of itself sufficiently destructive? Um, oh, well, um, e either, either because it is explicitly terrible, like being an arms dealer, or because they are supporting a system by participating in it in however benign a way that actually uh, furthers a status quo in which they have to keep supporting people charitably. Well, yes, I agree. You shouldn't adopt this route even if people tell you that the best way to make money is to sell arms illicitly. No, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I, I was assuming that doctors, lawyers, and Wall Street financiers are not open to it. I think <coughs> the Wall Street financiers have a lot to answer for as a result of the crash in 2008, you know, they were kept telling us, uh, leave it to us, laws of economics. <laughs> so that, that was bad. I don't think most of the ways of earning a lot of money are inherently so questionable. Uh, I may be wrong about that. I, guess, I, guess. I, I attach more weight to this idea of listing on everything you buy the effect on the environment and on global warming, etc., of the production of this good. I think that would have a huge effect. Because there are many, many people who'd like to make their choices of how they spend their money on themselves involve doing it in the way that does least harm. Uh, another question out there. Yep. Uh, so you mentioned different careers that would be effectively altruistic. Where does art fall in all of this? <laughs> well, if you think you can make a great deal of money as an artist, that would be <laughs> <laughs> And some people have discovered that they're able to make a great deal of money. That would be another example. Yeah. No objection to that if you carry out the plan and give one. Yes, uh, it's rather hard for me to know how to signal who should speak, so you just have to... Uh, so Michael Sandel uh, has a book called What Money Can't Buy, where he yeah. talks about how sometimes in incorporating market thinking ends up crowding out different values. And sometimes you can think about effective altruism as framing the good that you can do in terms of the money that you can give. Yeah. And underlying that is the assumption that the problems of the poorest have to do with money and less to do with institutional failures, failures in well, I, and all sorts of different... I think it's pretty clear that the poorest people in the world would benefit greatly if they had more money. But as you increase people's income, the benefit is less and less and less. And we're way beyond the point at which we get such benefits. I think although the though it's a question that's hard to measure, it seems fairly clear that although Americans earn twice as much in terms of real income as they did in the 1950s, they are not better off in terms of well-being. Um, so I quite agree, money gets less and less important as you get more and more money. And indeed what people are concerned with is comparison between them and others. It isn't how much they're getting. That's certainly not true about the poorest people in the world. Now, you have to be careful how you get the money to those people. Uh, you certainly can't do it by giving it to their governments. Um, 
So that's a business of choosing the most effective aid agencies, which I assume many of you know much more about than I do. Um, I, I was taking that as sort of granted. Um, yes. Um, <clears throat> so you've, you've given a, an instrumental psychological motivation reason for the 10%. Uh, but once someone has signed the Giving What We Can pledge and pledged their 10%, um, it seems that it starts to niggle, that, that act consequentialist demand starts to niggle at the back of one's brain. Oh yes, of course act consequentialists say you should give more. So, um, but what's, so I think maybe even other, other views would say you should give more. And, and at that point, you're no longer risking that you will go, you will not give because you've already given, you've already made your claim, you've already made the pledge. So how how does one well, determine enough in your? Opinion? I I was proposing a view that many people would find very disturbing. Um, I think in many areas, you can ask, would that be wrong? And they're helpful answers. Yes, that would be wrong, but this alternative wouldn't be wrong at all. I think in this particular area, I don't think there is any true answer to the question how much we ought to give. I think it's pretty plausible that nearly all of we rich people are giving less than we ought to give and are in that way acting wrongly. Um, but I think our main assumption should be, well, we ought at least to give the amount that would be required by rule consequentialism, such that if everyone believed that's what they ought to give, things would go better. That's a minimum. And then we do better if we give more than that. And we do better and better the more and more we give. Now, some people say that's unsatisfactory. We need to decide just how much you ought to give. Um, but that's my view about it. I think there is no precise answer to that. Um, Can I just follow up? You, you wouldn't yes. be saying that above 10 percent there was super erogatory, just that... No, I wouldn't yeah. say above 10 percent is immediately super erogatory. I'm inclined to think it's pretty plausible that 10 percent <coughs> isn't enough, but that if you give more than 10 percent, you're not giving the amount you ought to give, but you're doing better than other people, and you know, you're not obviously blameworthy. Now that may seem messy, but that's, I think, what most of us are likely to find believable. Um, I think we don't find at consequentialism believable. You should give up your life if you could save the lives of five strangers and so on. Most of us just don't believe that that's morally required. Um, now, I think there's a, there is another set of questions which is very difficult, which is how much difference does it make that you have moral obligations to promote the well-being of your children. Because that often will compete with how much you can give to effective aid agencies. So far I've only said that you should tell your children that they shouldn't expect to inherit much when you die. Um, but I know in America you come under great pressure of you know, paying for college education and so on and so on. Those are very difficult questions. Our consequences, we just say you have no obligation to give priority to your children. Most of us just don't believe that. Um. We take one final question and then we'll uh, uh, move to the central risks. Yeah. I can't see the clock, but what is five, five to seven. seven? So we have 35 minutes. To yeah, OK. One more question. Yes. Relating to an earlier question that you asked, I'm wondering what you think of organizations like GiveWell that try to determine which charities are the most effective and what do you think of that as a way of staying connected to the purpose of needing the money and making sure that's the most good? Oh, I agree. Um, and the point that I've just given most weight to is that as well as trying to decide which are the aid agencies that are most effective, uh, you should try to decide how you can be most effective in supporting these aid agencies. And the suggestion is very often, in the case of those who have been at Harvard and so on, you can do it by earning a great deal of money and giving considerably more than 10% away. Uh, transferring, 
I should say, considering all the 10% of the resources that you unjustly get awarded. It's, it's really embarrassing, the inequality. I mean, the increase in inequality in this country and elsewhere is quite appalling. It really is. I, I spent a week in hospital and one of the, in, in uh, New Jersey, and one of the nurses, we began discussing Medicare. Okay? And one of the nurses said she felt, felt sorry for the doctors who were going to earn much less under Medicare. And he staggered me. <laughs> <laughs> and I, this is, isn't relevant, but I started the story. <laughs> <laughs> I remember seeing a little film of a seven year old girl who was explained to her what happened in the United States if you, if you were ill. And she said, you mean, if you fall ill, they make you pay? <laughs> you couldn't understand it. <laughs> I would prefer you know, those parts of what we do to change that um, OK, well then, switch to existential risks. Well, I think we're living in the most critical part of human history. 20th century, I think, was the best of centuries and the worst. Um, it now seems fairly likely that there are no intelligent beings anywhere else in the observable universe. As one physicist said, where are they? If there'd been intelligent beings elsewhere in our galaxy with billions of stars, many stars are a billion years older than ours, those beings would have started colonizing that part of this galaxy. And we would be aware of them because you get different readings. No sign at all. So we may be the only intelligent beings in the observable universe. That makes it extraordinarily important whether we destroy humanity. Um, as I said in my first book, if we compare three outcomes, peace, a nuclear war that kills 99%, and a nuclear war that kills 100%, there's a much bigger moral difference between the second and the third, than between the second and the first. Um, the Earth will remain habitable for at least another billion years. Civilization began only a few centuries ago. Um, what we need to do is to start making the future of intelligent life dependent on the survival of the Earth. Now that one baby in your literature, I think the only other category of causes which has as much of a claim on our resources are preventing or trying to prevent existential risks, of which one example may be global warming if there really is a risk of getting in a runaway so that we become like Venus and life gets wiped out on Earth. Uh, there are some risks that we can't do anything about, like a massive asteroid. But if we manage to start spreading intelligent life elsewhere, we will avoid that. Now, it will be our successors who will live for another billion or more years. I don't think it's plausible to think that they will be human beings just like us. Some of them may be advanced variants of human beings. But whatever they are, I think it's extremely important that we enable them to survive and develop. Um, <coughs> I partly think that for the following reason. Many people are pretty pessimistic about human life. Um, people have suffered so much that it's not obvious that the existence of humanity <coughs> up to now has been worth it. Um, perhaps a majority of people have had lives worth living, but some people have suffered so much that it's not clear 
that it's been working on. But there's absolutely no doubt that in the future, we and our successors could make it worth it. We could create conditions that are much better than the ones that humanity has had up to now. And that could make the difference between intelligent life dying out for good in the near future on the planet Earth and intelligent, conscious, valuable life spreading all over the galaxy and lasting for at least a billion years. Now you see how staggeringly large the bad effect would be if we manage to destroy ourselves or we don't start to spread <coughs> soon enough. So I do think that that is a staggeringly great potential good or evil, the destruction of the human race. Um, and some of my work has been based on that, on the questions raised. And I'll just mention one example. I take an imaginary case in which we discover some way of giving ourselves a thousand years of happy life before our human body finally gives up. Uh, unfortunately, if we adopt it, everyone will be sterile. But we all have a thousand years of happy life. Imagine that that's what we do. Uh, then we have some farewell parties at the end, and then it's all over. <laughs> now, very many people think that it's very unclear that there'd be any objection to that. Because it's not going to be worse for anyone. The people who have the thousand years of good life, that they don't have children, that could give them a little life. And the people who don't later exist never exist. So it's not worse for any of them. Very many people think that about the future of humanity. I think that's a huge mistake, and I partly argue against it by pointing out that a similar claim applies, um, not to cases in which you're adding to the population or ending the human race, but to just to ordinary cases in which the policies that we now adopt will have some effect on the quality of life or standard of living two or three centuries from now. That's likely to be what would happen if we don't cut back enough on global warming. Many people two or three centuries now will then live in considerably worse environments and have worse lives. The problem is that those future people, we almost certainly owe their existence to our having adopted this policy if we'd adopted some other policy which used much less energy, that would affect who are the people who come into existence. And we can be almost certain that none of the people who exist two centuries from now would have existed if we hadn't adopted this policy. So if their lives are worth living, it won't be worse for any of them. Now, there's a similar issue that arises if some 14-year-old girl announces that she tends to have a baby and the parents and friends say no no you should wait uh, be better for your child if you wait you can give your child a better start in life well there's a sense in which that claim is true but if she goes ahead and has little Johnny and she gives him a poor start in life but his life is still worth living what she's done isn't worse for little Johnny. She waited, he would never have existed. I think, I hoped that when I described the cases in which we affect the further future, uh, people would think, well it obviously makes no difference that it won't be worse for any of those people. If we cause it to be the case that there are many pollution, floods and so on in the further future, those people will owe their existence to what we did. We not done it would have been different people who would later live <coughs> and have better lives. Unfortunately, I find that many people think, oh gosh, that means our obligations to future generations are somewhat weaker than we believe. 
because they won't have a complaint against us that we've made them worse off. Uh, just as Johnny doesn't have a complaint to his mother when he says, you shouldn't have had me when you were only 14. It's not a, a person-based complaint. Uh, he may, of course, agree that it would have been better if he never existed and another child had a better start in life. Um, so that was a pity. Uh, I mean, even John Broome, very good philosophical economist, says, well, he's convinced that there's less that we can do to violate the rights of future people, given this, what I call, non-identity problem. However, very few people think that it means we just don't have to worry at all about greatly lowering the future quality of life. They go to what I call the two-tier view, effects that make particular people worse off matter more than effects of just bringing about that the people who exist will be worse off. But the second kind of effect matter. So that involves giving up the person-affecting principle that what you're doing is bad or open to objection only if there are some people for whom it's worse. Okay. And that does at least have the result that when you go back to policies that may end humanity, there is an objection. Even though it's not going to be worse for any of the future people who don't exist. And given the size of the stakes, given the way in which our descendants could populate the galaxy with lives that are much better than the best lives today. Even if you give much less weight to these non-person affecting considerations, they're going to make it absolutely clear that this is a very high priority. So I think the only defensible alternative to working and giving to organizations that try to help the worst of people in the world today are giving and working for organizations that try to reduce existential risks. Now that raises other questions because the risks may be rather small. But the stakes are so high that even if the risks are small, it may be clear that we have very strong reasons to try to do it. Uh, okay. Um, well, it raises further questions, but that's probably enough to start a discussion. Um, Are there any questions? Maybe I'll start us off with, with a question. So most scenarios in which people talk about the destruction of the species don't involve something like giving everybody a thousand wonderful years and end sterility. They involve also a lot of suffering, a lot of death, early premature death oh, yes. for people, and that, that would seem to sort of over-determine yeah, well, these causes are very important, because it's a lot of people. Yes, but one way of putting that is this. Suppose you thought that some risk was pretty slight. There's a risk of 1 in 20,000 that an asteroid will hit the Earth in a way that kills most living people, or all living people. Okay. Now, that's going to be very bad for the people who are killed. But if the risk is extremely small, you may think it doesn't give you a very strong priority. But my point is that it's vastly worse. <clears throat> because preventing our successors from greatly improving conscious life and colonizing the galaxy, that put roughly, it's billions of times worse than just killing everyone on Earth. So that's why it makes a difference. Um, and if people say, oh, but it's going to be worse for no one, that really did need to be answered. Um, and I think, uh, okay. Right. So what do people think giving to prevent a kind of remote chance of something absolutely horrific from taking well, place? Well, I mean, Yes, there are many different cases. Global warming is rather different because there's a very high chance it's going to be pretty bad for many people and also rather disastrous for places like 
Boston and Manhattan that are on that sea coast. <laughs> um, the risk that global warming will end the human race is quite a lot lower. High likelihood of significant harm and the rather small likelihood of much worse. Um, so that's how I would respond to that. In other words, I think the people who are worried about the future of humanity and therefore devote their efforts to those issues, that's, I think, the only good, respectable alternative from worrying about the extreme suffering and early deaths of many people alive today. I put those as the two uh, respectively equally worthy important causes. Um, yes? So why do we focus so rigorously on human life and the extinction oh, it's of because human life? It's animals suffer, animals feel pain or oh, yeah, pleasure, and I'm animals about, have better or worse lives. So. Yeah, I'm talking about the survival of humanity because what that could then lead to. Well, none of the animals okay. are going to help intelligent life to spread from the earth. So, so that's know, all we're, we're the only for? ones who can do it. That's all we're good for then? Yeah. No, it's not all we're good for. We can do it. And actually, I mean, the, the thought that I begin with, I think it's not implausible that this is the most critical period in the history of the known universe. Because this is what could make a fantastic difference to the future history of the universe. Uh, it may become pretty devoid of life, or it might become wonderful. And we're the people who can affect whether that happens. Yes? What risks do you consider existential risks worth worrying about, and who's currently working to reduce them? Uh, well, there's a long list. There's a book by um, Martin Reese. Reese, yes, that's right. And he discusses the ten most likely causes of the end of humanity. I forget what many of them are. I mean, an easy one to think of is a huge asteroid. The chance of that is fairly small, but there's not much we can do about it. Um, if it's small enough, we might develop the technology to deflect it. So, I mean, I think in many areas we just don't know. I mean, another area that's much more likely than nuclear weapons to end the human race are certain kinds of biological warfare. Um, the point is, uh, a, a nuclear war followed by, I forget what it's called, but the nuclear war, nuclear winter, which there's no sun that reaches the Earth. That wouldn't kill everyone. But we certainly can't say that no one is going to develop a biological weapon that won't kill everyone. Uh, some people may. Um, so there are, different, there are different existential risks to be concerned with. Um, and one thing that's very obvious, and is the most obvious thing at all with respect to global warming, you don't need to know or think it very likely that these bad things are going to happen. It's enough that there's a significant chance. And if the bad thing that happens is as bad as I think the ending of intelligent conscious life is, then the risks have to be very small before it isn't of very great importance. But it's, it's very unlike the problems of the people who are suffering and dying, where there are no such uncertainties. And um, calculating expectations is not an issue at all. Yes? Um, so, there are some people who think that uh, artificial intelligence is coming soon. That is a very finely defined question. Superintelligence. Sorry to interrupt. Go on. Uh, Many people think that artificial intelligence is likely to be coming fairly soon. Yep. Uh, if it is designed badly, it would itself be an existential risk. And if it is yes. designed well, then it would be a risk for all the other existential risks.
tasks. Yes. Doesn't that make a lot of the other things we could focus on moot? <laughs> well, it makes, it makes the future of artificial intelligence one of the things that it's most worth focusing on. And I've just recently read, as you may have, Nick Bostrom um, called Super Intelligence, and that's what it's about. Um, <coughs> now, I think there's one question in that area that I have very great doubts about, and I think people are much too um, confident, uh, which is whether, as you often read in this thing, we're, we're going to get to the stage in which we can get uploaded onto a computer, and we can make ourselves immortal by being uploaded onto a computer. Now, many people think, well, we know that if we can create some computer, silicon and so on, that as well mimics the human brain, it'll have the same effect. The computer will become a conscious being. I think that's very unclear. Um, so, uh, but I agree that this is one of the areas that's most important. And people shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that there's a danger that these computers will turn against us and destroy us so that they can propagate. Because <coughs> we are going to be giving the computers as it were, the motivation that will lead them to do things. And it isn't the case, as in you know, 2001, that the computer will start developing emotions. But that, that, that is one of the main areas that we need to think about. Um, that's and the most obvious thing is that those super intelligent computers may enable us to solve threats to humanity that we can't solve. I mean, they think about lovely new way of deflecting the asteroids and so on. There are people who think that artificial intelligence is maybe dangerous, but emotions aren't the argument that leads to that conclusion. Uh, I'm particularly thinking of uh, Mohundro's research on uh, what are called universal instrumental values. Say you want to make, you make an AI and its goal is, I don't know, uh, be really good at chess. And so it wants well, to... Well, they've already done that. <laughs> but, but, you know, it could be better than that. And so to be the best possible chess player, it would have to convert all the Earth and all the stars into computers yeah, well, that's that obviously not chess. worth it. And I do think... <laughs> <laughs> and I very much doubt that that's true. Um, there are provable truths about games, and I think it's been proved the chess is either a win for white or a draw. They don't know which. But they might discover that it's a win for white. And that's not going to need a vast computer to work it out. Um, that's because it's a relatively minor problem for a computer chess. Uh, go there. Um, but, yeah. Other, yes? Um, can you explain what makes you optimistic that preventing existential risk is um, going to lead to such a great outcome? How do you know it won't lead to just a massively worse outcome than uh, annihilation of humanity? What makes you optimistic that things will go better in the future? Well, um, and that we won't spread suffering around the universe. Well, we we recently learned how to prevent or relieve much suffering, and we're going to get better and better at that. There's really, um, there are countless ways in which we could make life better for human beings as they are now. So even if you thought that most lives up till now have been doubtfully worth living, we could make it the case that that's not true. Now, of course, you can imagine <coughs> these new techniques being used by some satanic, torturous, sadistic dictator to make things even worse. But the fact that that's imaginable is not, I think, a reason for doubting um, that we would be more likely to make things go better and better for our descendants. I mean, until recently, there was extremely little that we could do. 
mean, I do think it's fairly likely that we're going to be able to greatly prolong people's lives and give them greater activity, postpone aging, relieve their suffering, and so on and so on. Give them more creative work. I, I'm struck by the fact, um, I, I read a book recently called, I forget what it was called, it was by the biography of Keynes, what's he called? Oh, sorry, I'm very bad at names. Skidelsky, yes, Skidelsky, father and son, which roughly says enough is enough. And it's about wealth here. Uh, but the thing I remember from it, which is quite striking, and it sounds very superficial, which is the meaning that used to be had by the word leisure. Leisure used to cover everything that you did for its own sake at work was the thing that you did. You didn't want to do it, but you had to do it. Okay. But now, you know, most people work so hard that leisure is just going back and slumping in front of the television or something like that. Um, we could enormously improve people's lives by making it the case that most of the time they were doing things for its own sake and not doing things just because they had to, to earn a living. Um, I mean, there's this odd fact over retiring ages, that most people want to retire earlier, but some people <laughs> want to retire later. Now that's very striking, but it's because for the second group, their work is, in the earlier sense, their leisure. They want to do it for its own sake. Most people don't. Most people have lives, uh, work jobs, which aren't like that. Um, and Keynes actually predicted that a century from when he was writing, most people would only work for about 10 hours a week. They'd have all this extra time for leisure. Well, it's not happening. Now, there's a striking difference in Europe and America, because in many European countries, France, Germany, and so on, they have nine weeks of holiday a year. Here, you mostly still have only two. Now, I don't know why Americans are so... We <laughs> <laughs> developed some plausible method in which very rich people could have the information in their brains safely frozen so that they could expect that they would be brought back to life when aging had been solved so then they could go on living. Mm -hmm. That actually would have a striking effect because these very rich people who are having their brains safely frozen will expect that they can come back to life in the future. And so the rest of their money they would spend on causes aimed to ensure that the further future is going to be worth it. <laughs> yes? So two people there. Okay. So when we're talking about effective altruism and then about uh, uh, existential risk, do you think there are any questions for you can see promising consequences of philosophical thought. Like, are there any questions where you think it's promising that will resolve something by thinking well, rigorously philosophically about it? What would I'm, be? I'm tempted to uh, say how I hope that what I've done might be able to be justified <laughs> in, in these um, terms. I wrote about future generations to the non-identity problem, what I call the repugnant conclusion, substantive questions about what's good or bad, what matters. Then I got increasingly distressed by the way in which most other philosophers uh, and most people in other branches of the academic world, economists and so on, just didn't seem to believe there could be normative truths of the kind that I was discussing. Mm -hmm. um, to give you one example, an economist recently gave a lecture, and then he said in the discussion that in his talk, he made no value judgments. And someone said, yes, you did. You said that if a policy was good for some people and bad for no one, we should adopt it. <laughs> and he said, 
that isn't a value judgment. Everyone accepts it. <laughs> I mean, it's an academic world in which people think a value judgment has to be something that people dis disagree about. That's fairly terrible. And it's also the case that in most work on rationality and so on, people assume that our reasons for acting are given by our desires, but we don't have any reasons to have the desires. I think that's a disastrous mistake. Uh, when I was writing the book on what matters, um, there was a good friend of my wife's in England who hadn't been to university but was very intelligent and uh, interesting, able, splendid woman. I realized I had hesitated to say to her one of the main things I was trying to do in the book, which was to try to defend the view that we can have reasons to care about things for their own sake. She was said, they pay you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but really, it's only people who've been to university, who've been taught that there can't be any normative truths, and have been taught that reasons are given by desires, you can't have any reasons to have the desires. I, I just think our normative thinking has got into a terrible state. And so I turned aside from these substantive problems to these deeper, more purely philosophical, meta-ethical books. And that's where I spend most of my time on. I hope to return in the time I have left to substantive problems and, and metaphysics. Um, but it is very striking how many people assume that there can't be objective, normative truths. That's had different causes. Um, in philosophy in particular, it's been the result of quine-inspired ontology. We mustn't admit weird entities into our ontology. So Mackey famously said there couldn't be any moral truths because they're too queer to be part of the fabric of the universe. That's a particular way of thinking about it what exists and what truths there are. I think in other areas of academic life, people have reached this view by thinking that all truths have to be empirically discoverable and testable and so on. And you can't have empirical tests for these normative truths. Um, and uh, many other people take the evident fact of disagreement as showing there couldn't be normative I mean, you could, some people, I'm one of them, compare irreducibly normative truths to certain others, non-empirical, which are logical, mathematical, and modal truths. Modal truths is that truth that 2 plus 2 must equal 4 and couldn't possibly equal 3 or 5. Now, that's not an empirically testable truth, again, but it's clear that it's true. Um, and, oh, what was I just about? Oh yes, the reason, one of the reasons why we recognize there are all these mathematical truths, that most of them have no use in physics, is that mathematicians agree. And then we say, oh well, in the case of ethical truths, people disagree, so there can't be a right answer. We just have to live with the fact that people disagree. Well, it's striking that the main example that's used in that argument is abortion. Well, that's a borderline case. You'd expect that there'd be disagreement about the point at which, or if there is a point at which, some entity enters the moral community. But I just think people make big mistakes when they assume that even under ideal conditions, in which we know the relevant facts and we're not distorted by self-interest and so on, I think we would reach sufficient agreement on normative truth. Um, and one example is the normative truth, which is amazingly denied by so many philosophers and others, which is that we have reasons to want to avoid future agony. Now, no one has doubted that unless they don't have the concept of a normative reason, which is true of many good philosophers, or unless they're under very strong ideological pressure of which one example I think is 
Aquinas, whose view, rather required by belief in omnipotent, omniscient, holy, good God, is that evil is just the absence of good. There is evil, but it's the absence of good, which implies that being in agony is no worse than being unconscious. Now, I don't think anyone who's got the question right has doubted <laughs> that we have reasons to want to avoid agony. That's why so many of you think we have reasons to relieve and prevent the agony of others, the lesser suffering of others. So my role in this task has been a, a great difference. It's trying to get more, basically you don't write for other philosophers, you write for students, the next generation of students. Trying to get more of them to believe that there are knowledge of truths about the badness of suffering and about what we ought to do. That's the part of this that I've been doing. Yes? So you said that we had a moral imperative to prevent existential risks. Right, you'll have to speak a bit louder. And we, all, um, we said we have a moral imperative to prevent existential risks, and we also have a moral imperative to prevent current suffering. Yeah. Uh, don't we also, I think, according to what you just said, have a moral imperative to prevent uh, future suffering as well? Oh, yes. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not assuming that present suffering matters a lot more than future suffering. Uh, but it's much easier to relieve present suffering. Um, no, but I'm not assuming that. I mean, many. one of the questions he suggested was, does the further future mat matter less because it's further in the future? No, absolutely not. It may matter less because we have stronger obligations to our children than to our grandchildren and stronger than to our great-grandchildren. But that's not just the passage of time. And on the standard discount rate that economists appeal to, they get the result that one death this year matters less than 10,000 deaths in a century. That's a terrible mistake. I may have got the figures slightly wrong, but it's of that order. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Derek. Forms where you can give us your email address or let us know what you thought of the event right here on the table. So if you're not on the email list and you'd like to be, come here.